so as promised, I've come to Melbourne Zoo to meet up with some colleagues and uh, I'm going to introduce you to Mark and Jose and they are both expert animal trainers. They're marine mammal trainers and they look after the seal colony here at Melbourne Zoo. Mark and Jose are going to talk to us about operant conditioning and classical conditioning and how they use all of the things that you've been learning about in lectures last week in their everyday work as marine mammal trainers. So let's go and see them. Hi guys, my name is Jose. I'm a keeper here at uh, Melbourne Zoo. And today we're gonna be talking about something that I find really exciting. We're gonna be talking a little bit about animal training, operant conditioning, and specifically about um, training seals. So the first thing I'd like to mention is that in modern zoos, um, there's been a, a massive change over the last few decades in, in the way that people um, people interact and train animals. Mm. Nowadays, the, the overwhelming majority of what we do has to do with the arranging the environment in a way that the animals can succeed and in using a lot of positive re reinforcement to get the animals to do the behaviors we might want them to do. So our priority at Melbourne Zoo in terms of the different types of behaviors we use um, is uh, husbandry behavior. So behaviors that allows the animal to voluntarily participate in its own uh, health care, so mm -hmm. medical behaviors. Uh, and, and, and there's a variety of them, and later on, uh, hopefully we can get to show you a few simple ones. So that's our number one priority. And then we have uh, a few other sort of uh, types of behaviors that we also um, work with, with our animals. Uh, some of the behaviors are behaviors that are high energy behaviors for them to have a little bit of a workout and a little bit of an exercise session. Some of them are more like a cognitive uh, challenge type session, give them something to mm. think about, a small little puzzle to solve. And some of them might be behaviors that in some way we, we might benefit from having it in the presentation. So presentation behaviors as well. Mm. Now, in terms of um, animal training in general, you guys might have heard already some of these terms. I hope I'm not being uh, too basic or too boring for you guys, but um, we work a bit with classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Um, and you might have heard about classical conditioning and how Pavlov used to condition dogs using um, the sound of a bell. So I'll give you a quick practical example about seals in what re uh, regarding classical conditioning. So one of the things we use here um, is a clicker. So if I pair that sound with, um, with a fish, so I do that sound and I offer to seal a fish, and I repeat that 5, 10, 15, 50 times, eventually, eventually that sound's gonna start carrying some meaning. The other one we use a lot is our whistle. Whistle is very popular in marine mammal training uh, facilities because that sound travels very well both outside and, and underwater. So both mm. at the surface and underwater. So same thing, I blow the whistle, I give the animal something it enjoys, like a piece, like a like fish, and over time the animal becomes conditioned to um, to find that stimulus meaning in some way. Mm. Now, um, the reason we use a bridge um, is is to be able to pinpoint a moment in time in which the animal does something correctly. Okay, it's especially helpful if the animal is doing something at a distance. If the animal is doing something 10 meters that way, and I want to pinpoint a specific element of the behavior the animal is showing over there, I can blow that uh, whistle or click that clicker the instant that uh, the animal does that uh, behavior, right? And then I just bought myself a few seconds for the animal to come back to me or for me to go to the animal and offer some, um, some additional uh, reinforcer like fish for example. Mm. So that's that's one of the, the most important uses that we have for those tools. I'm so glad you mentioned that timing is so important. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because the animal might be, doing, might be doing 10 things in the space of five seconds. So mm. you, you definitely can benefit from uh, the possibility of having that tool that can pinpoint um, a moment in time or a certain element within the behavior that the animal is doing at the, at the time. Mm. So very helpful, especially in the learning stages, especially for behaviors that might be happening at a distance. So uh, in terms of operant conditioning, um, 
we use a lot of positive reinforcement here um, and if we, if we are talking about reinforcement and punishment, reinforcement means that the behavior is likely to be maintained or increase in the future and punishment means that the behavior decreases in the future. Um, so when we, when we say that we use positive reinforcement, we, what we mean is that a certain behavior um, is going to become more likely in the future or is going to be maintained in the future because we are going to add something to the environment. So the positive comes from that plus sign. We're going to add something to the environment. The negative would be removing something from the environment. Um, an example with seals for negative um, punishment, for example, so making a behavior less likely, um, could be in certain situations, um, it's, it, it doesn't happen very often, but it could be in certain situations if the seal is not um, wanting to participate in the session, we can just walk away. And because mm. we carry a pouch with fish and they like the fish, yeah. Um, we are making uh, we, we are making whichever behavior triggered us leaving that situation less likely in the future, and it's negative because we are removing something from the situation, which is us with a pit, with a with a pouch full of fish. It's excellent, yeah, perfect explanation, and it's all about the so the timing again is important, isn't it? In the, Absolutely, it's a consequence that occurs after that target behavior that you want Absolutely. to modify. So, say for example, you have two seals; they're supposed to be stationing in front of you, but instead of mm. that, they are having a sort of, some sort of altercation with each other. Mm. You can walk away from that situation. Yeah. So, the theory yeah. would be that uh, that behavior would be less likely in the future yeah. because it caused the super valuable trainer with the fish to walk away. Yes. And is that what you see in practice? Yeah, you tend to yeah. you tend to see to see yeah. that. Even though the other thing we would bring into that situation would be we would try we would try to set up the situation the next time slightly different yes. to make it more likely yes. to, to be successful. Yeah, so right. you're modifying the, the environmental conditions to promote Absolutely. success. And, yeah, we could know, change it slightly the position of the stations or yeah. where we would or, or maybe we would go with more trainers so that one could pick up a seal and so yeah, we would look at the situation in a way that we wouldn't have the behavior in the first place. Very clever, yeah. Right, okay. Now, what else do I have here? Now, I'm gonna show you a few tools uh, or a few things that we have here mm. uh, that makes teamwork a little bit easier in, in this space. So, um, one of the things we use is the hierarchy of behavior change procedures. Uh, shared by the shared with us by the brilliant Dr. Susan Friedman, um, and when we look at that, we always try to stay within these first few options in terms of turning right when we go up the road, mm. because this is where when we look at these elements here, from health and nutrition to antecedent arrangement and to positive reinforcement, when we look at those options, all of those have a low risk of negative side effects. Mm. Mm. And they have a, a very, and, and they will not uh, negatively damage the relationship with the animal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we keep going up that road, we will start hitting some speed bumps and eventually some yellow and red um, yes. signs. That's because we're starting to go into more risky situations. Yes. So animal trainers try to stay away from positive punishment, for example, yeah, yeah. as much as possible. Mm, mm. The, environment, the environment will already provide enough positive, reinforce, uh, positive punishment to the animals. Mm. The environment typically provides enough positive punishment to us as well. Mm. So we should try to steer away from that yeah. um, at all times. Yeah. And it's not a good long-term strategy for modifying behavior as well. Absolutely. As soon as you remove that threat of positive punishment, the behavior commences Absolutely. again. Yeah. yeah. And going back to something that I said earlier on, it has, I mean, traditional training back a mm. bunch of decades ago yeah. used to have a lot of elements of positive punishment and negative reinforcement. Yeah. And now the focus is, is quite significantly different. Yeah, definitely. We try to look a lot at antecedent arrangement and positive yeah. reinforcement training. Mm. And avoid all of those negative emotional uh, results and damaging Absolutely. that relationship and so Absolutely. forth. That's great. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So... So two of the elements that we might have here, the antecedent and the fact that we, that, that we might be providing something in the situation uh, in which we are using positive reinforcement, mm -hmm. they kind of go hand in hand with the ABC approach that um, Dr. Susan Freeman also talks about a lot. 
um, and that the A is for antecedent, the B is for behavior, and the C is for consequence. So of those three elements, two are environmental and we can influence them. Mm, mm. So we can set up the environment in a way that the animal will succeed and we can provide a consequence after the, the behavior that will change the frequency of that behavior in the future. Mm -hmm. So we have two thirds of um, power, if you will, over that, that simplest form of behavior that, that we can deal with, right? Mm. So we use that a lot. Sometimes if we are struggling with a certain behavior, what we do is we film it mm. and then we slow the footage down. We have a look on the computer and we try to see, okay, what was happening exactly before the animal did what it did mm. and what, we do, what did we do right after the animal did it. Yes. And sometimes if we change one or both of those, we can, we can have different behaviors. That is fantastic technology to have at your disposal. Yeah. I did not have that at my disposal yeah. back in the day. It was all VHS tape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. nowadays we use a lot. It's a great tool. Yeah, we use our smartphones and action cameras all the time. We film sessions and if we're struggling with something, we can always, we can always have a look at it and, and try to pinpoint exactly what happened before mm. and what happened after the behavior and yeah. changing either should help us modify that behavior in the way that we want. Fantastic. All right, next topic. Okay, now more fun stuff. Uh, specific, <laughs> specific about seals. So I told you already about the bridge, so enough about that. Now, in terms of how we start training seals, um, there's some behaviors that are typically used early on. One of them is stationing them. So I can, so this pallet here can work as a station. I can send a seal to to that space, and as soon as the seal is on that space, I can bridge and reinforce the seal for doing that. Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, an example of stationing. Uh, and another station could be just a rock in the main pool, or could be um, a set of stairs that we also have. They look at lots of different elements within this environment as yeah, stations. As stations, yeah. And their default is always to, to try to see where's the next, where's, where's the, the nearest station. And, and usually if you leave a seal here, she's gonna start Yes. We're gonna start slowing yeah. up. This is where I got reinforced a lot in the past. So, exactly. So they're yeah. gonna they're gonna tr try to default to that space. Yes. Station. Then the other one we have, let me grab this here. It's targeting. So we teach the seals to put their nose to a target. If we do that, we can move them. We can do move them up onto th some uh, up onto things, off of things, into things. So we can get the seal to do lots of behaviors. We can get them to lie down by following that target. Lots of things. Um, porpoising around the pool usually involves the use of a target, a bigger one than that one, mm. but tends to, we tend to use them to follow that target out of the water. So super popular tool um, in the marine, the marine mammal training world. Mm. So stationing and targeting are two big things. Um, if we have a seal that is not super comfortable with people and we're starting off with that seal, mm -hmm. we always have the ability of doing a bunch of sessions in protected contact. There's mm -hmm. a barrier mm -hmm. between us and the seal, and we're just going to build that relationship in the early stages, having that extra physical protection. Yes. Right? So that's another thing that can be used early on in training. Yeah. Um, we train by shaping. So shaping means that we have a bunch of steps and that could be a written plan, depends on the facility and how they look at these things. But typically people tend to have a written plan and they have a bunch of steps that they want to go through. Um, and, and, and you have the end behavior in mind, but mm. you want to be able to deconstruct that behavior to very small, simple elements. Mm. And you start at, at something very simple. Uh, for example, let's say you want, you want to have a seal, uh, raise a flipper and allow you to inspect that flipper. Mm -hmm. Maybe step number one uh, is just a, a small little movement of that flipper. Yeah. Not the whole thing yes. all the way to, to what you want. Yeah, yeah. And then you're going to have a bunch of steps and you're going to be slowly raising criteria until you reach the point in which the seal raises the flipper and lets you touch and inspect the flipper. So that's a very crush course explanation of that's a very good very shaping. simple and eloquent explanation of shaping definitely awesome. all right and then since we have a, a team of of trainers the other thing is establishing criteria so everyone knows the criteria for a certain uh behavior uh for example for a flipper present it would be raise your flipper and get your tummy off the floor yes 
Um, so we establish that criteria. We, we even take a picture or make a small video clip of how it looks. Yes. We have it over there on the computer. Fantastic. So that anyone can have a look. Yes. Um, and if there's any doubts, we chat with each other and we, we, we discuss it amongst ourselves um, yeah. so that everyone is on board and is, is um, using the same criteria for that specific That's behavior. brilliant. Doesn't confuse the seal. They get reinforced for exactly the same behavior every time. They know yep. what to expect and yep. so forth. Absolutely. It's outstanding. Yep. It's almost like marking criteria for, for markers yes. on assignments really, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And then just the last thing um, in terms of how we uh, operate, we usually start with one seal and we start with simple behaviors. Uh, we have five levels of behaviors. The number level, level one are really easy, simple behaviors and level five are medical, kind of a little bit potentially more invasive procedures. Yeah. So we start with the easy ones and then we progress to more complicated ones, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and then once we tick off uh, the behaviors that the seal can do, we can move on to a second seal. We usually start with seals that are very comfortable in these situations and with people, with new people. Mm -hmm. And then we progress to the ones that um, can potentially find new situations and new people a little bit more frightening or, or unnerving, if you will. Um, so that's how we progress. We take it nice and easy. We try to set ourselves up for success as well. So yeah. we start with the easy seals, if you will, and then we progress to the ones that could be a little bit more uh, uncomfortable in these situations. Mm, mm. And then finally, let me just show you this colorful thing over here. This is our training board. It has all our animals here at the top. The four top ones are the seals. And then we have, we have otters, etc. Um, and what this does is it tells us uh, what's happening for the day in terms of um, behaviors, um, and we group the behaviors in a few different sections here, medical, management, cognitive, and keeper development. Doesn't mean that this is all, for example, today we have a few magnets here. We could look at the key and see what they are. Uh, for example, Tawin is gonna have a urine uh, collection training session today. So that, that's an example. Doesn't mean that this is all that is gonna happen with the seals on the day. Yes. This is sort of our baseline, and we definitely want to tick those boxes, but we can do stuff on top of it. That's wonderful. Additional stuff. Tell me, what's uh, the shape recognition activity there? Shape recognition is what, it, it's just a term we use here, but what it means is match to sample. Yeah, right. So we got a couple of shapes here, and we got a couple of sheets over there that we can carry with us. And yes. the idea is, if I show the star, yes. the seal is supposed to go to the star. Yes. If I show the square, the seal is supposed to go to the square. Fantastic. They're still learning it, so yeah. we don't have any seal that is um, an ace at it uh -huh. yet. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, we're working on it. Great, fantastic. Yeah. So in the context of everything, the reason we train is because these are really, really intelligent animals. Uh, and, and anyone who's got a cat or a dog at home can probably understand this. If you take your dog or cat to the vet the first time, it's a unique experience. The animal hasn't experienced that before, but when it goes through the the experience, which in often, in many cases, at a veterinarian, isn't that positive. Mm. The next time you try and emulate that and set it up, and it might be a familiarization with a pet pack or whatever transport means, that animal will instantly pair that negative event with the pet pack, and you know, then you've mm. got a cat on the roof or climbing mm. up the curtains or a dog spinning around. Yeah. So seals are super intelligent. Mm. You know, as intelligent as any dog and the smartest of the dogs. So naturally, they too would obviously have with negative veterinary experiences develop that stigma mm. so our training is all about making that veterinary experience positive so <laughs> the the sort of analogy I make is that you know most people don't really like dentists yeah. it's quite a horrible experience but if your dentist was your best mate and you went and saw your dentist every day and you played a game of pool and he cooked you a beautiful meal or she you know told cool stories or whatever and all of a sudden that going to the dentist was an amazing experience Every now and then when they dived in for a root canal or whatnot, it would be very, very tolerable. Absolutely. So what we try and do is do things with our seals every day, veterinary experience, we pan a little bit here, little things that may be intrusive and that the animal probably wouldn't tolerate in isolation, but if we do it all the time with positive reinforcement, then the seal tolerates it and actually then does that, you know, of their own volition, participates in their, their husbandry and their medical care. Mm. 
So it's really important for their psychology and obviously in delivering best husbandry for these animals. And so what Jose is doing now is emulating eye drops. Mm. And you can see she's holding that eye perfectly and the behavior ends when Jose bridges. Flipper. So all of these behaviors come from a medical back, uh, point of view. We need to palpate all over the seals. We need to be, have access to all their body parts. Um, and obviously when they're not under duress, it's easier, but hopefully the behavior and the continuous reinforcement and all the foundation we lay mean that when that animal is ill and under duress, and we ask the same thing, you have the legacy that means that you'll get that behavior. Yes. So this is yeah. all about building up to a point where it's critical and you actually need to execute in a real medical situation and the animal participates voluntarily. Mm. So again, you've got Jose laying down tail and palpating across her body. She's a little bit uncomfortable because her head's off, but you can see what he's doing. And she trusts him enough and they've established this relationship where she allows him to do this. And in part, that is due to the reinforcement, but it's also about building foundations and ongoing bonds. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? She's trusting him as a strange fat man with a camera pointing at her. Yeah, and you know. Two feet away and... Uh, it's a very vulnerable position for a seal to be in, isn't it? It is, yeah. absolutely it is. And you know, and, and that's part of the conditioning as well, you know. Mm. Establishing a behaviour and doing it in an environment where there's no variables mm. is one thing. Mm. To introduce those variables over time, and you need those variables because if you have the vet down, you've got machines that go ping, you've got people yes. in strange outfits, you've got all these other things that you've got to add in. So if we're going to do a medical procedure, we bring in those elements. They're the approximations that we bring in so that when it comes to the day, there's no variable the animal hasn't seen, they're confident and they know what to expect, yeah. and they choose to be, participate in that medical procedure as they know it. The only difference might be that they might get that needle that has been practiced poking them actually pierces the skin. Yeah. Or the machine that goes ping is actually a machine that goes ping and not a cardboard box that we sat next to them and yes. said ping next to. Yeah. So... <laughs> And Taiwan is classic. Taiwan has been through everything, every medical procedure you could ever think. Yeah. And she is absolutely bomb with it. Touch. Um, and, you know, and that's great as well because at, at the zoo, you know, we have a duty of care for their animal husbandry. Yeah. But we also have a job to make people fall in love with seals. Ultimately, we want people to come to the zoo and go, seals are the coolest. We need to do everything in our power to make sure that we keep seals protected in the wild environment so that we can have seals forever and ever. Mm. Yeah. So if that means people can come up and get close to a seal, and fall in love with a seal, then that's part of it as well. So having a bomb-proof seal that we can sit next to someone and know that this seal isn't going to bite them on the ear or run away in horror yes. is part of what we do as well. So it's all about conditioning these animals through a whole bunch of stimulus to be bomb-proof. And this seal is, is bomb-proof. She is gorgeous. I'm in love with her already. Uh, she is... Uh, Everyone's favourite seal. Alright. Just grab a target, maybe? Yeah. Sure. Hold. Oh. So, as Jose was saying before, one of the foundation elements of our training is target. And Jose can show you the extension of that and how it might be utilised. Good tail and munches on it. Correct. Target. Okay. Now let's say she didn't know what to go on the stairs. Yeah. Target. That could be an option. to get a waiting for you. There we go. Waiting. Woohoo! Is that her favourite? Mm, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> for the moment, yes. Um, okay, this is another thing we can show. Mm -hmm. A little bit more this way. There's other versions of targets we use. Target. <laughs> so 
Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The targets are, are really good. Not only you mm. can see that how you might train a series of behaviours using a target, but it also gives the animal something to focus on. So if you have a particularly wary animal, sometimes having them on target takes their mind over whatever manipulations yeah. or whatever. So it just it gives them a point of focus that is, is sometimes really valuable. Yes, really. See, all those behaviours that Jose done there are an extension of target behaviour. So when he's indicating a seal over with his hand, that was once a target that has then moved into a hand. Yeah, cube. yeah. And the, the, this head motion, you can imagine if you had a target pole yes. and then you're moving it up and down, eventually over time you can approximate the target pole out and it becomes a shape with a finger. Yeah. So the target pole is replaced with a cue that emulates the target pole. And so does that translate through to your presentations when you're doing shows during the day? Do you use body language? Um... Sure, sure. So, you know, we... The cues are visual and verbal. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh -huh. and animals should follow both. And you can see Jose there asking for a groom but also giving the, uh, the classic Toby Jug. <laughs> and so uh, Jose and Mark have been kind enough to uh, look after us this afternoon and introduce us to a seal. Um, so, of course, you're watching Animal Training on YouTube right now, but you can also come and um, see Animal Training live here at the zoo, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it depends what time of the day, but as everyone in the zoo, more and more training is an integral part of what we do. Particular departments like ours, it's the foundation, and we do training all day, every day. Other departments are less so. But if you want to come and see Animal Training at the zoo and see it in context, come to the zoo... Hopefully you can, you know, have a look at some of the shows that we do here. Take the opportunity to say hello to the trainers. Zookeepers tend to be really friendly people. Um, have a chat <laughs> to them about what they do, what they do, how they do it. You know, uh, just keep learning about training. It's a, it's a very valuable tool and, and can be used in so many different facets of your life. Not just with animals, but it's amazing how you can train people as well. Um, this is true. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we're always here. So if people want to come down and uh, talk about training, we're here. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Mark, and thank you, Jose, for all of your help today. I'm sure everybody loved your, uh, your time and attention that you gave to uh, giving us a great presentation, and that was awesome. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure if I told you how I became interested in SEAL training, but SEAL training is certainly how I became interested in psychology, and that's the reason I went and did some degrees in psychology. I became interested in SEAL training as a high school student. I did work experience at an aquarium, and then uh, the weekend after my week of work experience, they gave me a job on the weekends while I was still at school, and so that's how it started for me. But everybody's got um, I suppose a different journey, and you might be thinking after having seen Jose's amazing skill with conditioning and how cool his job is that you might be interested in being an animal trainer in the future. So uh, let's ask Jose how he became interested in uh, animal training. Sure, sure. So yeah, everyone's different. My path is different than anyone else in this section. Uh, for me, um, I did marine biology degree back in Portugal and then I did a marine resources master's. Started working in the meantime, worked for over three years as a marine mammal trainer in Portugal. Halfway through that time, I started training dogs as well. So I've always been a bit of an animal training nerd. Um, and then I went to America, studied a second master's there in experimental psychology. And lived for a bit in Cape Town, South Africa, training dogs at the time. And then came to Melbourne three years ago. I've been at uh, Wild Sea Melbourne Zoo for a little bit over two years. So yeah, I think that's pretty much my wow, part so far. Wow, that is so a far. fascinating journey. Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time at uni. I, I don't think that every single person out there that wants to work hands-on needs to spend that much time that I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was my path. Everyone's yeah. gonna be different. Back in the day after I started um, SEAL training, I did a marine science degree, but it ended up having very little to do with SEAL training, but it certainly sounds like you've really gone on. You've gone and done that experimental Psych masters? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. 
And so is that the sort of thing that maybe led you towards the uh, the shape matching? Uh, uh, we're always it, we're always digging for new cool things to do with yeah. our seals, new yeah. interesting things that would in some way, shape, or form improve their welfare. That was one of them. So now and then, if we have a little bit of free time, we go on Google Scholar and see, okay, what's been the latest? What are other people doing? Yes. Uh, we're always digging into other facilities and what they've been training. Yeah. Um, and then we pick some ideas. That that sounds cool. Okay, let's let's see what we can do about it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty much. Thank you again, Jose. I really no appreciate your help. Anytime. Cheers.